Live from Boston, Massachusetts, welcome to this edition of PathCast. My name is Emilio Madrigal, and today I am joined by none other than Dr. Robert Young, who is the Robert E. Scully Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Young, Young will be presenting a GYN pathology session titled Sex Scored Stromal Tumors of the Ovaries and Some of Their Mimics. As always, please feel free to enter your comments and questions in the chat windows. So with that, I will now turn the microphone over to Dr. Young. Good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, perhaps if some of you are in a different uh, time zone. It's a great pleasure to present this uh, lecture to you, and I'd like to thank Dr. Madrigal for the invitation. The topic is one of my uh, special interests, as we'll get to uh, in a moment. Before that, however, in as much as this is, of course, hopefully an educational uh, exercise, I would just draw your attention to the fact that we at the Massachusetts General Hospital, the largest and actually first teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School, uh, do do a number of educational exercises throughout the year on uh, pathology topics of uh, interest. This is information about the Harvard Un University uh, Department of Continuing Education, which sponsors and organizes these meetings uh, with us, should you wish further information. I think the website for the various courses, particularly one that I'll get to now, uh, next month in Scottsdale, Arizona, will be available to you through uh, Dr. Madrigal. Uh, this course that you see a picture of, the hotel, I've given or organized for about 15 uh, years or so. It's at a very lovely resort hotel in the foothills of the mountains just north of Phoenix, Arizona. If you don't know the Scottsdale area north of Phoenix, it's a lovely uh, part of the world and a very attractive location in January for those such as myself who are sitting here in the freezing <laughs> northeast winter of the United States. So perhaps some of you might be interested, even at this somewhat short notice. This is one of two uh, meetings we do during the winter, actually, of this uh, very similar type. The second one is in March at a very nice resort hotel, as you may get a sense of from the nice pool and water here. It's near Fort Myers, Florida, where there's a major airport easily accessible, and it's actually a very charming part of southern Florida, where in March, I can assure you, the weather is almost always very, very pleasant indeed. So anyway, should these be of interest to you, it will be wonderful to see uh, some of you at these exercises, either this year or next year, when we have them also scheduled at slightly different but essentially similar time frames in January and March. On to the lecture for today on sex cord stromal tumors and their mimics. This is a very, very large uh, topic, of course, and I can only cover uh, some of the lesions under this rubric, but I hope I'll make some points that will be of interest to you because you must have a special interest in ovarian tumor pathology or at least some reasonable interest in it, otherwise you wouldn't be listening here uh, at this point in time. These tumors are fascinating morphologically uh, because of their broad range of appearances and all the different things that can look like them to some degree. They're special uh, in my heart, as they say, because when I came to this hospital about 38 or 9 years ago now uh, and ended up working with the great Dr. Robert Scully, at that time he had seen many, many tumors of this type in his remarkable career, which I hope you're familiar with, but actually hadn't submitted many of them to uh, publication. So I was fortunate enough that he made them available to me and a modest number of publications ensued, as you may have seen if you've been following the literature uh, over the years. I'm actually going to restrict my comments here this morning to three major tumors in this broad category. The sex cord stromal tumors, of course, include tumors that are pure sex cord tumors, pure stromal tumors, and those that have a little bit of both, so-called mixed sex cord stromal tumors. Stromal tumors, many of them are rather dull, like the fibroma, for example. Some of them are quite interesting, like sclerosing stromal tumor and one or two others, but we just don't have time in an hour or so to get into this entire category of neoplasm. So maybe if Dr. Madrigal gets a good response from you all on another occasion, 
we may do the stromal tumors and even the sex core tumor with annular tubules, which I'll also not get into this morning just because of time constraints. I've decided to focus my comments largely on, I think, the most important of all the tumors in this broad family, the granulosa cell tumors of both adult and then juvenile types, and then the intriguing uh, Sertoli Leydig cell family of neoplasms. The first point to make about the granulosa cell tumors, which we will start off with, is that as many of you, I'm sure, if not all of you perfectly well know, they're divided into adult and juvenile forms. And these are terms, <coughs> like many in pathology, of convenience. The adult tumors or the adult designation is used for the usual familiar form of granulosa cell tumor that typically, but not always, occurs from about 45 years of age on. They peak at about around 50 to 55 years of age. And the designation juvenile granulosa cell tumor was introduced by Dr. Scully in the late 60s, early 70s, when he began to appreciate that in young people under 30 and even more so under 20, granulosa cell tumors look rather different from the morphology seen in the older patient. Then he wanted some reason or some name to give them, so he just elected the designation juvenile granulosa cell tumor. But there are many terms in pathology that are imperfect, and this, these are actually terms because some adult granulosa cell tumors occur in juveniles, and rarely you see the juvenile granulosa cell tumor in an adult patient, but they still serve the purpose for labeling uh, the tumors uh, from the viewpoint of kind of just referring to them. And actually, to make a point about the designation, I, re I use this paper by Dr. Charles Zalodek, still in practice at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, some of you may know, and Dr. Henry Norris, who was one of the great pathologists of Dr. Dr. Scully's uh, generation, was the head of GYN pathology at the AFIP for many years. This tumor actually is of some historical interest because Dr. Scully had first mentioned in detail the juvenile granulosa cell tumor in his first fascicle on ovarian tumors published in sort of 1978 or 79, it might have been. But there was no paper on these tumors as of 1982, and Dr. Zelotic and Norris were the first actually to describe in some detail the juvenile granulosa cell tumor of the ovary, but it was part of a paper looking at granulosa cell tumors of the ovary of both types in children. And to make the point I was alluding to earlier about how adult granulosa cell tumors can be seen in children, in this series of 32 patients who are 16 years of age or less, the vast majority of them, not surprisingly, were juvenile granulosa cell tumors, but they had three perfectly typical adult granulosa cell tumors in children. So if a colleague sees you know, shows you an ovarian tumor from a 12-year-old girl, and it looks to you like an adult granulosa cell tumor, and they say, oh, no, it can't be because she's 12, well, you immediately say, no, of course it can be that. Just because she's 12 doesn't mean she mightn't have an adult granulosa cell tumor. This is actually a very early dis good discussion of the juvenile granulosa cell tumor. And this is actually the breakdown of the cases in that paper I've just noted. Three of them were cystic, not otherwise specified, I assume, just because the lining was dilute, denuded and they couldn't fairly classify them. But you see the majority juvenile, but certainly the three I've just alluded to of the adult type. So we're going to now discuss the adult and then juvenile granulosa cell tumor. But before we do, there's actually a similarity in the clinical presentation of both the adult and juvenile forms related mainly to the age of the patient and where she stands in life, if you will, with regards to her menstrual as circumstances. Is she a prepubertal girl in whom sexual precocity is very common because, of course, these tumors often produce estrogen and often enough to cause sexual precocity in a young girl who's not yet uh, entered the uh, middle years of life. In young patients, young females who are post-pubertal but pre-menopausal, uh, various menstrual irregularities, amenorrhea, menorrhagia, etc., may be seen. And inasmuch as the majority of tumors in this overall family are adult granulosa cell tumors, and most of them occur sort of 50, 51, 52, etc., etc., many of these ladies are in the early postmenopausal years, and postmenopausal bleeding is a common presentation of those 
uh, neoplasms and these tumors overall in a postmenopausal patient. Of course, not all these tumors produce enough estrogen to cause any clinical issue. <coughs> and one interesting aspect of granulosa cell tumors of either type is that about 10% of them, as you can see in the third last line in front of you here, present with an acute abdomen because these tumors are often quite hemorrhagic and the cysts with blood can just rupture and therefore you can present with an acute hemoperitoneum, which can indeed for that matter be life-threatening. And then of course some of these tumors may be small, may just be an incidental finding in a hysterectomy specimen. The classic scenario there is someone in the early postmenopausal years gets vaginal bleeding, she's evaluated, that may show hyperplasia of the endometrium, even maybe a low-grade carcinoma. Hysterectomy is done, and of course the ovaries are generally taken out at that time of life, and they may find in some of these cases then a small granulosa cell tumor, which is of course then uh, almost certainly the cause of the estrogenic manifestations in that particular patient. The slide you now are looking at shows part of the great range of gross appearances of the granulosa cell tumors, again of adult or juvenile type. These are actually all adult neoplasms, but they could be juvenile granulosas. I show another example of juvenile later, just to show an example of that particular tumor. But either form may be and is typically solid and cystic, as you see at the top left, and you see the blood in cysts I've just referred to. They may alternatively be very solid and ye uniformly yellow, as you see at the top right. Top bottom left may be diffusely hemorrhagic. I don't know if this one presented with pemoperitoneum, but one would think it perhaps did. And then at the bottom right, perhaps one of the more challenging gross appearances is when you get a solid and cystic tumor, dominantly cystic with some solid neoplasm, neoplastic tissue adherent to the wall of the cysts, and this can look for all the world like a surface epithelial neoplasm. So therefore, there's a great range of appearances that one may, one may encounter on gross inspection. And ultimately, of course, is what one sees under the microscope that makes the diagnosis. This just happens to be another gross I just couldn't resist putting in because it's a recent mass general case, which shows the solid tissue again, particularly at the bottom right which has a very distinct yellow color because there's often a little bit of lipid in either the granulosa cells or even more so the luteinized theca cells that may be present in the stroma of these tumors. And then there's just a more nonspecific, almost pebbly-like appearance with some focal hemorrhage in most of the picture here. And just another picture which is slightly out of focus, for which I apologize, but it's the only it's a good picture nonetheless because it shows a somewhat almost papillary, friable appearance. And I think most of us looking at this might think of a surface epithelial tumor of one sort or another. This is sort of a pseudo-papillary pattern. One can see both grossly and microscopically, as we'll get to, in some granulosa cell tumors of either form. Now, when one writes about the microscopy, of the adult granulosa cell tumor, which my next pictures are all examples of, frequently we begin, or rather typically one will emphasize quite early in the discussion, the call Exner bodies, which are a classic feature of the adult granulosa cell tumor. And of course, they're seen nicely in this particular image. These are these small micro follicles of relatively uniform size and shape, small rounded formations. Now they may cause problems in actually two different guises. First of all, they're so famous as a feature of this tumor that people think, oh, granulosa cell tumors of adult type have to have call exner bodies, or someone might be reluctant to make the diagnosis because there aren't call exner bodies. Well, you see many adult granulosa cell tumors that have either no call exner bodies, or they have only a small number, maybe on one of many slides. So. If someone's showing you a tumor for your opinion and there aren't call exner bodies, that doesn't rule out a granulosa cell tumor of adult type in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. And then the other mischief maker of these formations is that they are small rounded formations, but many other tumors have, conformation, have formations that look very similar. The acini of a carcinoid, micro follicles in some, in some endometrioid carcinomas, and even other 
uh, formations and diverse other neoplasms. So you have to appreciate that the overall features of the case, including the cytologic features, are good for granulosa cell tumor before you label these called extra uh, bodies. Macro follicles, which are the second variant of follicles seen in these tumors, are actually even less common than the called extra bodies, but I just throw one in here for uh, just to have an example for you. Now, when you actually see the next granulosa cell tumor that comes along in your experience, on the law of averages, I would submit to you that most likely it's going to look somewhat like what you see here, a rather diffuse, featureless growth of small, relatively uniform cells, which are round to oval, as you can see in this illustration. And you're going to have a broad differential diagnosis, obviously based on something looking like this. But the good news is that in as much as this is an epithelial neoplasm, meaning by that, of course, epithelium in the broad term, nothing to do with surface epithelial, just meaning it has epithelial type cells, you see various epithelial formations when you take any number of sections of a tumor that might have the picture I've just shown you. For example, here we see a very nice delicate corded pattern, almost slightly gyriform. People talk about gyriform, of course, remember, resembling the gyri, the gyri of the cerebral cortex, and sometimes people talk about the watered silk pattern, rather nice delicate pretty arrangements of cords. So they betray the fact that you're looking at a tumor with an epithelial nature to it fundamentally, and therefore is a very quick guide to the fact that you're looking at an adult granulosa cell tumor, when of course other features, particularly the nuclear features, are consistent with that particular diagnosis. Now the granulosa cell tumor of adult type has a tremendous number of patterns. We see many here in our referral material. I think probably hardly a week goes by that we don't uh, see an example. And you know they can vary tremendously. I could pull out 10 granulosa cell tumors of adult type. Uh, they all look quite significantly different from each other. So just some other examples. Here's a nice insular pattern of granulosa cell tumor. Two very large nests are seen sort of at the two o'clock position roughly in this particular picture and that, uh, kind of almost in a, in a line towards the bottom of the picture you see little trabeculae nests depending how you want to describe the particular epithelial like formations seen uh, before you. Most of the time the granulosa cell tumor of adult type has scant cytoplasm which is a big contrast from the juvenile tumor which we'll get to a little bit later. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delicate eosinophilic cytoplasm and sometimes there's even more overt than in this particular example. But in this figure just as in my first picture of the microscopy of adult granulosa cell tumor you note a very uniform cytomorphology. The cells are very regular one to another. I don't see any mitotic figures, I don't think, in this particular uh, picture. You can see mitotic activity, and sometimes it's actually rather brisk. So if a tumor is an otherwise typical adult granulosa cell tumor, but quite brisk mitotic activity, don't necessarily have your confidence shaken in the diagnosis. You might want to get an inhibin stand to confirm the diagnosis, but they may be mitotically active. I might just comment that, of course, inhibin and calretinin are perfectly reasonable special stains to get to confirm an adult granulosa cell tumor diagnosis, if perhaps you haven't seen that many in your own experience yet. But most of the time, I think the H&E will make the diagnosis with some confidence. And rarely you do see an adult granulosa cell tumor for whatever reason, technical matters perhaps does not actually stain very much, if at all, sometimes for uh, calretinin and, and or uh, inhibin. So if you're confident in H and E, it's a granulosa cell tumor. You should probably stick with your diagnosis. This picture obviously shows striking nuclear grooves. The classic description of the nuclei of a granulosa cell tumor of adult type. We emphasize their paleness and nuclear grooves. Maybe to be candid, both are overemphasized a little bit. For example, some of the slides I've already, sh already shown you, the nuclei I don't think are really that pale. They're certainly not very, very dark and hyperchromatic, but they're not always that pale using a strict 
literal definition of the English word pale, and nuclear grooves are rarely going to be as conspicuous as you see in this particular image, which of course I've used just because it shows nuclear grooves uh, so nicely for you. But you want to see some nuclear grooves here and there in the neoplasm to really make you feel confident you're looking at a granulosa cell tumor of adult type. Now both the adult and juvenile granulosa cell tumor may have a macronodular pattern and this is an example of that and actually one other feature of these tumors which may be striking uh, from time to time which is extensive sclerosis. If you notice at the top here obviously the bluish areas are the macronodules and then the pinker tissue is extensive sclerosis. Sometimes the tumor undergoes just marked sclerosis. It's a little bit analogous to the regression you see in testicular germ cell tumors. At least I make that analogy just for somewhat, um, it sort of conveys the point a little bit. So you could actually get a biopsy at frozen section of what would might clinically seem to be a good scenario for a granulosa cell tumor. And you could potentially just get a lot of hyalinization that might confuse you, in which case, of course, <coughs> you might want to take another section from a different area of the tumor. Notice here we don't see any hint whatsoever of collectioner bodies, so it's just a macronodular pattern of adult granulosa cell tumor with sclerosis. And sometimes in the nodules of the adult granulosa cell tumor, you see a somewhat pale appearance, as you see here. And I've briefly mentioned that sometimes the adult granulosa cell tumor may have cells with appreciable eosinophilic cytoplasm. We talk about luteinized adult granulosa cell tumor, but in those tumors you'll usually find some non-luteinized, more typical areas. In some adult granulosa cell tumors you get a somewhat pale quality to the cytoplasm as you see here, and it tinctorially resembles quite a lot the look of what one sees in the comas, and in our experience, sometimes the nodules, as you can see here, may have this particular thecoma-like appearance. And with Dr. Jennifer Stoll, a former member of this department, now working in Minnesota, we have a paper in press in the GYN Pathology Journal on these so-called adult granulosa cell tumors with thecoma-like foci, and it's an area where a reticulum stain may be very, very helpful. I encourage you to get the reticulum stain to confirm a granulosa cell identity to areas like this because, of course, it will show aggregates of cells devoid of reticulum in contrast to the uniform investment pretty much of every cell where this to be truly a thecoma. So, you know, the whole issue of granulosa cell tumor versus thecoma has been discussed in great detail over the years. For example, in Dr. Skelly's first book on ovarian tumors of 1958, Endocrine Pathology of the Ovary with Dr. Jack Morris, he discusses or they discuss the coma versus granulosa cell tumor. And it's interesting that recently we've felt the need to explore the topic and to actually reinforce the help the reticulum stain can provide in those cases. And indeed in other cases of adult granulosa cell tumor, for example, just yesterday I was sent uh, by a very, you know, a very experienced pathologist, a rather fibromatous adult granulosa cell tumor, somewhat like the image you see on the left panel here, in which there's a rather delicate emergence of granulosa cells from a background fibromatous stroma, and on the right from this case, you see a reticulum stain showing, of course, quite a lot of reticulum in the stromal compartment, which these tumors have, but many areas there's not much reticulum, so that's highlighting areas which are much better for a granulosa cell tumor. So, you know, many granulosa cell tumors of adult type are just pretty much all granulosa cells, but then you can get any and all admixtures of granulosa and stromal elements that may look fibromatous, may be truly thecomatous, but be careful they're not just thecoma like granulosa cell tumor, and the reticulum stain can be very helpful in delineating in an individual case, well, how much of this is granulosa, whereas how much of it is, of course, truly uh, stromal in nature. Here's another tumor that was a very stromal predominant adult granulosa cell tumor, and the, there's an inhibin stain here highlighting the areas that were truly granulosa. There's a little bit of faint staining in the background stromal components, but it's just a more modern way, perhaps, of highlighting the uh, 
granulosa cells in a tumor that's kind of a granulosa stromal cell neoplasm. Now on to another issue with these tumors, which is the cytologic atypia. It's usually limited, and the teaching point over the years is if you see atypia of any note in a tumor that you're thinking in a granulosa cell tumor, be very careful. And that is true. However, there are some granulosa cell tumors that kind of bizarre degenerative nucleotypia of the type you see here, which you're all familiar with because of its occurrence, of course, in the lyomyoma of the uterus. We all know about the lyomyoma with bizarre nuclei. And you see in granulosa cell tumors a similar phenomenon, which you can apply the descriptive designation, granulosa cell tumor with bizarre nuclei. And just as with the lyomyoma, you look at this and you think, gee, that looks rather worrisome, doesn't it? But then your colleague will say, gee, it's odd. I don't see any mitotic activity here. If this was a, a bad bit of tumor, didn't you think there might be some mitotic activity? And of course, one would think there might be. And this is just a bizarre degenerative, bizarre lyomyoma type atypia one sees in about 2% of granulosa cell tumors. It's actually more common, as we'll get to, in the juvenile granulosa cell tumor, but it's seen also in the adult for many years ago. I think it was around about 1983 or thereabouts, Dr. Skelly and I reported a small series of sex called stromal tumors with bizarre nuclei. I'm testing my memory here. so. You, you can check me out later if you look at the paper. I don't think I'm off for very, by very much. I think we maybe had 17 cases, if I remember. I think eight were granulosa cell tumors, seven were Sertoli lighting, and two were thecomas. So in that particular series, those three forms of sex stromal tumor had bizarre atypia of the type you see there. And you see again here, this is a more friendly, helpful slide because, of course, on the right-hand slide as we're looking at the image here on your computer we see the bizarre atypia and on the left one sees much more friendly reassuring banal cytomorphology of classic adult granulosa cell type and of course obviously sampling is important to delineate or to d disclose classic features of adult granulosa cell tumor but this could be very challenging if at frozen section you happen to get the bizarre nuclei alone, you could be quite forgiven for making a diagnosis almost of undifferentiated carcinoma. So just be aware of that pitfall. It's obviously a rare phenomenon, but someday somewhere, one of you or some other pathologist somewhere is perhaps going to have that vexing situation uh, to deal with. The granulosa cell tumor, of course, in the older literature was often referred to as granulosa theca cell tumor, a term actually that has some merit to it because many of them do have a stromal component, which I've already highlighted or mentioned to you to some degree. Uh, sometimes it may be just areas that look like any old fibroma of the ovary, such as the case I saw yesterday that I've mentioned to you a few minutes ago. And here's another one in which on the left-hand panel, one sees a typical diffuse adult granulosa cell tumor down near the bottom, and there are a few cords and ribbons of cells. But there are areas of cells with abundant pale cytoplasm. These are luteinized cells just spotting in a spotty manner throughout the background of a diffuse adult granulosa cell tumor. And the stromal cells in these cases may have pale cytoplasm, which is actually more common or they may have a more luxuriant eosinophilic cytoplasm, as we see on the right, like the typical cell one sees, for example, in an ovarian tumor with luteinization of the stroma, such as a mucinous tumor, which often has stromal luteinization. So you can see these lutein-type cells in a granulosa cell tumor from time to time. And actually, once in a while, you'll even see crystals of Renke. I don't think there are any in this particular image, but you do rarely see Leydig cells in a granulosa cell tumor. Now, moving on to the differential diagnosis of the adult granulosa cell tumor. Well, when you think of the various patterns, diffuse, follicular, miscellaneous epithelial, etc., etc., as we list some of them here, all those are patterns that may be seen in numerous other uh, ovarian uh, tumors. And if you look at the essay Dr. Scully and I wrote back in, I think it might have been circa 2002, on patterns and cell types of ovarian tumors in the journal Seminars in Diagnostic Pathology. You would see a table like this, but an even longer table to convey all the different patterns and cell types that one can see in the adult granulosa cell tumor 
and other uh, neoplasms. So let's just look at one or two of the things that may be uh, in the differential diagnosis of an adult granulosa cell tumor with microscopic images in a moment. Bef but before that, just a bit of a laundry list, as they say, of tumors in the differential diagnosis of the adult granulosa cell tumor. Some of these I'm going to look at with you in a moment, but some of them I won't because we just don't have the time to show them all. So just one or two comments. Well, I've discussed to some degree cellular fibroma. It's, I would say maybe one out of 10 granulosa cell tumors. The differential diagnosis will be, is it a cellular fibroma or is it a, quotes, fibromatous, if you will, granulosa cell tumor in which there is a background of fibroma, which may be cellular, but you see in areas granulosa cells evolving out of that background stromal uh, nature. And that's where the, the reticulum saying, as we've mentioned, can be helpful. Uh, we're going to look at the second entity in a minute. Undifferentiated carcinoma can come up with those bizarre nuclei. We're going to look at the small cell carcinoma of hypoglycemic type. And we're going to look at most of the others, if only very briefly. So perhaps why don't we move on? Uh, this is a so-called pseudopapillary pattern of adult granulosa cell tumor. You see the last line on the table here was surface epithelial papillary carcinoma. You could get a frozen section of an ovarian tumor, and it might look like this, and you might think, oh, gee, is it a transitional cell pattern of serous carcinoma, or is it some other papillary tumor of the ovary? This is actually a phenomenon that Dr. Julie Irving from uh, British Columbia, Canada, and I described some years ago in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology, granulosa cell tumors with a pseudopapillary pattern. Most of our cases, as I remember, were examples of juvenile granulosa cell tumor, but you can see it with the adult granulosa cell tumor also. It's probably just sort of a degenerative phenomenon, maybe like occurring in that, remember the last gross I showed you that I make, made a comment about the resemblance to a surface epithelial tumor? In a, in a gross like that, under the microscope, you might see something like this, which would not unreasonably make you think you're looking at a true papillary neoplasm when it's not a papillary neoplasm, it's just a granulosa cell tumor with what we call a pseudopapillary pattern. Now, the stroma ovarii uh, of the ovary, obviously the commonest form of monodermal teratoma of the ovary, can actually come into the differential diagnosis of the uh, adult granulosa cell tumor because sometimes the adult granulosa cell tumor has little hyaline spherules in the collection of bodies which kind of look a little bit like the colloid of the uh, of a microfollicular pattern of stroma or varii. The good news here is, of course, sampling is usually going to tell the uh, make the distinction association with the dermoid cyst for stroma and so on and so forth. And of course, obviously, here's an area where immuno can be very, very helpful. Immuno is much done in ovarian tumor pathology. I will parenthetically point out maybe a little bit more than it needs to be to be candid with you. But there are certain areas, of course, where it can be tremendously helpful. And of course, if you're thinking of struma versus granulosa cell tumor, you've got very obviously crisp immuno that will help you in the differential diagnosis. And it was proven nicely in this old case we studied some years ago now you're looking at a tumor here that was actually reported as a granulosa cell tumor of the ovary arising from a dermoid cyst. And you could see why that it looks quite like a granulosa cell tumor to me, trabecular pattern, small cells, somewhat pale, etc., etc. But of course, if you have a tumor associated with a dermoid cyst, what's the most likely thing? Well, you know, a monodermal teratoma, carcinoid or stroma arising from a dermoid cyst would be a bit odd for a granulosa cell tumor to arise from a dermoid cyst. Well, anyway, we just stumbled across this report in the literature, and it came from somewhere where we, we were able actually to get the material available to do some immunostains. And to cut a long story short, the tumor you're looking at reported as a granulosa cell tumor was actually proven by nice thyroglobulin immunoreactivity to be an example of a confusing pattern of struma ovarii. I mentioned earlier how the asini of carcinoid can look potentially like the collectional bodies of a granulosa cell tumor. And of course, the carcinoid and granulosa cell tumor each have insular patterns. Here's a gorgeous insular carcinoid, which often has this punctuation of these little micro asini around the periphery of the otherwise cellular nests. 
as you can see here, even at this magnification of the image, you can see, I think, a sort of granular eosinophilic quality at the base of the uh, cells in many areas, particularly at the rim, at the periphery of these nests of granulosis, of carcinoid, excuse me. There's just a pretty insular carcinoid with a little acinite that could, by persons other than any listening this session, possibly be confused with an adult granulosa cell tumor. And one biggie in the differential diagnosis of the adult granulosa cell tumor is endometrioid carcinoma. Back in 1982, Dr. Skelly and I described endometrioid carcinomas resembling sex scorched omal tumors in a paper that Dr. Jaime Pratt, the very eminent Spanish pathologist, co-authored uh, with us. And that was prompted by Dr. Scully's, by that time, having seen quite a number of tumors that he thought were endometrioid carcinomas, but they had asini that you see here that looked a bit like call extra bodies and various other sex cord-like patterns. And others then used the term Sertola form endometrioid carcinoma for that category of neoplasms, because in our first paper, we emphasized kind of a mimicry of Sertoli and Sertoli lighting cell tumors. But I would say that these tumors as much resemble a granulosa cell tumor from time to time as they do a Sertoli or Sertoli Leidig cell tumor. So anyway, either a granulosa or Sertoli that Sertoli Leidig may be mimicked. And these, this is an endometrioid carcinoma you're looking at. You wouldn't necessarily know it from this image, but I hope many, if not all of you, know that one of the patterns of endometrioid carcinoma that can be confusing is a microfollicular pattern, such as you can see here. Uh, which, of course, mimics, of course, the collection of bodies of the granulosa cell tumor. And then some of the other patterns of endometrioid carcinoma. I remember vividly this case from many years ago, gorgeous trabecular pattern that anybody might think might be the trabecular pattern of adult granulosa cell tumor. Another, I guess, trabecular pattern, maybe the trabecular just even but a bit thicker. In this particular example, you're looking at tumors that in other samples were clearly endometrioid carcinomas. And remember, endometrioid carcinomas, like other ovarian tumors in the surface epithelial family, particularly mucinous tumors, may have stromal luteinization. Here we see beautiful luteinized cells with abundant pale cytoplasm looking like the luteinized cells I showed you in a diffuse adult granulosa cell tumor earlier. So you don't, you know, you could look at this and think, oh, these are granulosa elements, these are luteinized elements of the granulosa cell tumor, when in fact you're looking at a granulosa cell tumor with thick trabeculae and the nonspecific stromal luteinization. Stromal luteinization, parenthetically, remember, is most common in mucinous tumors of the ovary, but I think a second most common, I'm, I'm pretty confident when I say this, that the endometrioid carcinoma second most often has stromal luteinization. It's pretty rare to see it with either clear cell or serous carcinoma. Not that it can't be, but it's pretty uncommon. Now here's another tumor that is an endometrioid carcinoma. And you look at this and say, wow, endometrioid carcinoma, a bit odd. Well, yeah, it is because it is a striking insular nested pattern. But the pathologist greatest helper in evaluating ovarian tumors, I submit to you, is thorough sampling of neoplasms. You get help from many areas, obviously a broad knowledge of the microscopic features of tumors, the clinical setting, the history, other is there a previous tumor in the body that might make you wonder about a metastasis, the age of the patient, and so on and so forth. But thorough sampling, when you have a challenging ovarian tumor, make sure you take plenty of sections because it's going to help you so often before you necessarily have to resort to more modern techniques such as immuno. For example, the slide you're looking at, let's look around a little bit. And here are these nests again at the bottom. And there's the most typical endometrioid glandular neoplasia ceiling that this has to be an endometrioid carcinoma with a granulosa-like insular pattern. So in summary, with regard to this little portion of the talk, this is just a listing of the features of endometrioid carcinoma that can cause confusion with sex cord tumors, and I think I'll leave it for you to have it as a memory jogger later on, uh, should you wish. And just from the viewpoint of, well, what are the features that suggest an endometrioid carcinoma rather than a sex cord tumor? Well, these vary from gross to microscopic.
Extra ovarian spread, should it be present, is a little bit more typical of an endometrioid carcinoma, I suppose. But, you know, many of the endometrioid carcinomas that simulate sex cord tumors are actually low-grade tumors, so they're more typically confined to the ovary. So it doesn't actually help you that often. If it's present, it helps you, but it's usually not present. Bilaterality, same thing. Endometrioid carcinoma is more often bilateral than sex cord tumors, but it's usually not bilateral, so therefore it doesn't often help you either in actual practice. So the middle three here, I think, on conventional good practice of surgical pathology are the three that will help you most. Typical endometrioid carcinoma, as I've shown you a moment ago, and then squamous differentiation. There are a few things in pathology that are absolute you know, we say never say never and never say always. Well, I would say to you, you never see squamous differentiation in a sex cord tumor. So you have the differential of an endometrioid carcinoma in a sex cord tumor and you see squamous differentiation. It is an endometrioid carcinoma. And two very helpful findings, grossly and microscopically, are bullet number five here. Many low-grade endometrioid carcinomas that may mimic a sex cord tumor arise out of a background adenofibroma, which you might even appreciate grossly, or certainly may appreciate microscopically. And of course, endometrioid carcinoma with clear cell carcinoma is one of the dual of carcinomas of the ovary, most typically arising from endometriosis. So for example, you might see a polypoid mass projecting into an endometriotic cyst, which if it looks a bit sex cord like under the microscope, it's hardly gonna be a sex cord tumor because it's an association, of course, with an endometriotic cyst. And finally, of course, immuno can help you. Actually, shortly after our paper on endometrioid carcinoma simulating uh, sex cord tumors, maybe two or three years later, Dr. Scully, who was one of the first to actually apply immunostochemistry in evaluating ovarian tumors with Dr. Aguirre from Mexico and Dr. Ann Thor, uh, reported a series of these tumors which were EMA positive, unlike sex cord tumors, and of course inhibit negative. And that still remains a very helpful duo of findings uh, in the evaluation of ovarian tumors. It's a rather crisp, almost always helpful pairing, if you will. Just another thing, uh, and it brings us, of course, to one of the features of ovarian tumor evaluation. Now, is there a history of another tumor? Here, for example, is an insular pattern of neoplasia uh, the cells are relatively bland on this low power magnification. Indeed, on high power, they're relatively bland. However, they're very, very uniformly round, I think it's fair to say. <coughs> and the nuclei of a granulo the, cell, the nuclei of a granulosa cell tumor, apart from the nuclear grooves, are often somewhat angulated and have a kind of a contour to them, which contrasts with what one sees here. And this is actually an example of a clinically proven case of metastatic lobular carcinoma to the breast. I think it's the only form of breast carcinoma that's going to really ever perhaps bring the differential diagnosis with an adult granulosa cell tumor into consideration, as it did minimally in this particular case. Now on to one of the great mimics of granulosa cell tumor, usually the adult granulosa cell tumor, but once in a while the juvenile granulosa cell tumor and this is, of course, one of Dr. Scully's many famous entities, arguably but one of his top ten hits, as they say. Uh, he, he described, of course, many original entities in gonadal pathology, gonadoblastoma, small cell carcinoma, and many others. And this is one of the more important ones because, of course, this unfortunately awfully malignant tumor uh, still can be misdiagnosed and was, of course, obviously misdiagnosed before he recognized its features, first actually described in detail in his 1978-79 fascicle, which I think contains the first illustrations of this tumor uh, correctly interpreted. Anyway, this is a tumor of the younger patient most of the time, so therefore the age is usually against, for example, adult granulosa cell tumor. You notice a mean of 23 for these tumors, whereas of course the mean age of adult granulosa cell tumor is about 53 years of age. These tumors are famous because of the association with hypercalcemia, but that's actually only present in about two-thirds of the cases. These are almost invariably unilateral, but so, of course, are most sex cord stromal tumors. Uh, if you happen to have an adnexal mass and you happen to have a differential of small cell carcinoma and adult granulosa tumor, and there is hypercalcemia, 
what is not very likely to be an adult granulosa cell tumor actually because the adult granulosa cell tumor as you can see doesn't appear on this listing of ovarian tumors with paroendocrine hypercalcemia uh, prepared many years ago my, by my great friend Dr. Philip uh, Clement, the outstanding uh, uh, Canadian pathologist whose name I'm sure you're all familiar with from his many writings over the years, his co-authoring of the fascicle with Dr. Scully and uh, so on and so forth. Just as a brief digression onto the issue of ovarian tumors with hypercalcemia, note in the younger patient, the tumor we're talking about right now is by far the commonest, but in the older age group, clear cell carcinoma is notably quite frequent. The only other comment I'll make from this listing, otherwise of kind of miscellaneous things, is that this tumor appears as, at a 6% uh, level of you know, tumors with paraendocrine hypercalcemia. And of course, the point is that this germanoma and small cell carcinoma occur at the same uh, age group, broadly speaking. So therefore, if there's an excellent mass in a 20-year-old, it could be small cell carcinoma hypercalcemic type. It could also potentially be a dystromanoma, so just be aware of that. And it's further a little bit tricky from time to time because if you were to look at the left-hand portion of this screen here and someone would say to you, well, let's say she's 21, what does that look like? You might say, gee, it looks a bit like a dystromanoma, lobulated, creamy neoplasm. And of course, some dystromanomas can have hemorrhage and necrosis as one sees in other areas of the tumor. So when all is said and done, if you were to be shown this case from a 21-year-old woman, or let's say someone between about 15 and 25, I think your differential diagnosis would be three things, dystrominoma, small cell carcinoma, hypercalcemic type, and lymphoma. And there actually is a little bit of overlap potentially in those three neoplasms. I've seen cases of dystrominoma confused with small cell carcinoma, hypercalcemic type. Sometimes a small cell carcinoma hypercosemic type can look a little bit like uh, lymphoma. So some examples now are uh, further comments on the small cell carcinoma of hypercosemic type. It is designated such because the cells are typically small and actually even though it's a terrible malignant tumor, they're actually relatively uniform most of the time. If you actually see tumor giant cells in a neoplasm and you're thinking it might be small cell hypercosemic, that rules it out. It can't be is one of these funny enigmas of surgical pathology, a highly malignant tumor, but doesn't actually have pleomorphic tumor giant cells any time. Very mitotically active, for example, m much more so, for example, than the adult granulosa cell tumor. I mentioned a second ago the differential diagnosis of this tumor can be with lymphoma, and actually one of the first cases Dr. Scully ever had, he had the differential diagnosis with lymphoma, and that was in the pre-immuno days, and I know that case was a challenge for him, but luckily, most of the time, even though these tumors can have a very diffuse, somewhat lymphoma-like appearance, you will see obvious epithelial formations, nests, and so forth. And of course, the reason this comes up into the differential diagnosis with granulosa cell tumors is about 80% of small cell carcinomas of hypercosemic type have follicles. So usually actually macro follicles, as you can see here, but they can be small once in a while. So therefore, the reasonable differential of a granulosa cell tumor does come up. And I think it's almost certain that most of these tumors in prior times were actually called granulosa cell tumor. So for example, any series of cases of granulosa cell tumor of adult type with a very worrisome high figure of malignant behavior almost certainly contains some examples of small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type. That's why it's hard to evaluate the prognostic conclusions of a granulosa cell tumor papers in the older literature. I will point out that these follicles of the small cell carcinoma hypercalcemic type are only seen in small foci of most of the tumors. So therefore, you know, if you find it, it's very, very helpful, but don't expect to find it necessarily if you come across one of these tumors. Now, one of the many enigmas of ovarian tumor pathology, and I suppose you could say pathology in general, is exhibited by the small cell carcinoma of hypercosemic type because the cells are not always small. I think they were all small in Dr. Scully's first series of cases, or if they were, if they were not small, maybe he didn't particularly make much of it. But anyway, subsequently he began to see cases in which a large cell morphology, as you can see here, dominated or at least was relatively conspicuous in the tumors. 
and that led or has led to us using the colloquial or descriptive designation large cell variant of small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type. The good news is these are usually just focal in an otherwise typical tumor, but you have to be aware of the fact that you could tomorrow potentially see in a young person in their early 20s a large cell carcinoma looking like this, and you might think, oh, it's just undifferentiated carcinoma of the ovary, and you should very much consider the possibility that you're looking at the so-called large cell variant of small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type. The stroma of the small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type usually is rather non-specific, and in fact, usually rather non, non-abundant. But strangely, in some of the large cell variant foci, you can get a rather conspicuous centromos myxoedematous stroma, as you can see here. <coughs> and a remarkable fa- feature of this tumor is the presence in about 12% of the tumors of mucinous epithelium. And why do I mention that? Well, there's actually a very rare granulosa cell tumor that has mucinous epithelium. But if you have the differential diagnosis of small cell hypercalcemic and granulosa cell tumor, and there is mucinous epithelium, it's statistically much more likely to be the small cell hypercalcemic tumor. And if you look very briskly, mitotic, et cetera, et cetera, you're almost certainly looking at the hypercalcemic neoplasm, which is a terrible malignant tumor. Here's the vascular uh, permeation often seen at the periphery of the tumor, and it's a very, very ominous neoplasm, sadly. Now, there are a couple of metastatic tumors that can mimic adult granulosa cell tumor. The two biggies, in my opinion, are malignant melanoma and endometrial stromal sarcoma. There's a very nice paper on metastatic melanoma. Oh, back some years ago, my Dr. Patrick, Patrick Fitzgibbon and colleagues from the West Coast of the United States. It's one of three big series of metastatic melanoma in the last 20 to 30 years. And they, in their series, uh, made considerable play, quite appropriately, of the differential diagnosis with an adult granulosa cell tumor. For example, here is a case from our collection of metastatic melanoma to the ovary. And I think you can see that's a reasonable mimic of the adult granulosa cell tumor, finding of pigment, immuno, color of the neoplasm, history, etc., obviously will be helpful. And remember endometrial stromal sarcoma of the uterus, which is the commonest sarcoma that spreads to the ovary, can look quite sex cord like when it grows in the ovary. And if you have uh, ovarian tumor or tumors in your hands, and the uterus has been previously removed, you might want to wonder, well, why was the tum- uterus previously removed? And we've had the experience of looking at a sex cord-like tumor, observing that there's not a uterus, which there would normally be, of course, in a postmenopausal patient if the ovaries are taken out, usually the uterus is taken out. And lo and behold, sometimes the uterus was removed because there was a stromal sarcoma, and that explains the findings that one sees in the ovary. So beware in a postmenopausal patient <coughs> a case in which you have ovaries but you don't have the uterus. It might possibly have some relevance to the interpretation. Let's move on now to the juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Just one gross. Their spectrum is as the adult examples I showed you earlier. Here's a solid lobulated yellowish tumor. The only point of showing it is that it was only about three and a half centimeters in size but caused full-blown sexual precocity in a young girl of four and a half years of age. This was a Mass General CPC, circa 1981, if I remember correctly. Here's another gross. These may be very cystic, just as may the adult neoplasms. It's at the microscopic level that this tumor differs from the adult granulosa cell tumor. And here are the differences. I think in the interest of time, as time is uh, moving along here, I'm going to leave that slide and just show you examples under the microscope, and you have this as a kind of a checklist later on. Here we see two of the features of the tumor. This is a very eosinophilic pink slide because the tumor cells are luteinized. The adult granulosa cell tumor looks blue most of the time. Juvenile granulosa cell tumor looks sort of pink most of the time, as you see here. And also the follicular pattern of the juvenile tumor is more irregular and branching, small follicles, as you see top left, larger follicles in the center, and this one in the center kind of meanders as like the Rhine River or some river branching with all sorts of tributaries 
uh, as you can uh, see. Here's another example of juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Note again the varying size and shapes of the follicles and the very eosinophilic cytoplasm obviously evident as you can see here just some other examples because this tumor just like the adult tumor can vary quite a lot you can see solidness from which follicular differentiation seems to evolve out of them for example the top right in particular we see obvious macro follicles they typically can say in eosinophilic fluid but it can be a basophilic fluid from time to time here's another juvenile granulosa cell tumor which is actually worthy of comment because it doesn't have that eosinophilic look that most of these tumors have and Dr. Scully is sadly no longer with us but if he were and you were to ask him what is the cardinal distinction between the juvenile and adult granulosa cell tumor that made him first segregate the two tumors he would say it was the immaturity of the nuclei of the granulosa cell tumor at a much brisker mitotic rate. He then observed that most of the time the juvenile tumors have abundant cytoplasm. Most of the time they have a more irregular follicular pattern. But the sine qua non distinction between adult and juvenile actually rests in a more primitive, immature character to the nuclei. Just another example of one of these neoplasms which does have the more typical somewhat eosinophilic nature. And here's another one where eosinophilia is not that conspicuous, but note the nuclei here, they're maybe the same size and shape, roughly, of those of the adult granulosa cell tumor, but I don't see nuclear grooves. They're generally very infrequent in the juvenile tumor. I mean, you might see one or two, of course, but there's actually very brisk mitotic activity, one, two, three, four, five, six, or thereabouts, on this one high part image of juvenile granulosa cell tumor. So briskly mitotic. Here's the macronodular pattern of this tumor, which Dr. Zolotic and Norris nicely emphasized in that paper I mentioned near the start of the picture. And again, we see the mitotic activity and the eosinophilic cytoplasm of this tumor. And this tumor, even more so than the juvenile gran than the adult granulosa cell tumor, excuse me, has bizarre nucleotypia, as you can see here, without any proven impact on ad adversely on prognosis. Although I get worried if I see this in great abundance, I have to say, and it does, I think maybe someday someone will prove that it does have some adverse prognostic significance. It was not evident from our initial series of cases published in 1984. A huge differential diagnosis here, I leave you for your own study. Pregnancy luteoma, maya follicle-like spaces, finding of the lesion in pregnancy will obviously be a big clue to the diagnosis of pregnancy luteoma. The giant follicle cyst of pregnancy in the purpurium that Dr. Scully and Clement described circa 1980, 81, 82, I forgot exactly when. Huge cystic lesions seen usually late in pregnancy. They are lined by cells, as you can see here. This is, the whole, as I said, said a second ago, the giant follicle cyst. You might think of a luteinized juvenile granulosa cell tumor. You don't see mitotic activity as you'd expect in a juvenile granulosa cell tumor. You do see some nuclear atypia. Indeed, it's rather characteristic of this giant follicle cyst. So nuclear atypia unassociated with mitotic activity is good for the so-called giant unilocular follicle cyst of pregnancy and purparium rather than cystic, adult, cystic juvenile granulosa cell tumor. I mentioned melanoma in the differential diagnosis of adult granulosa cell tumor. It's also in the differential diagnosis of juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Here are follicles in a metastatic malignant melanoma in the ovary. This is a famous case. I think it may have been uh, reported as a letter to the editor, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I remember in my early years of a very happy many year experience of looking at cases with Dr. Scully and being sent this case. He was the one who established the diagnosis of metastatic melanoma. I don't remember the whole saga, but it was quite a saga. But you can see how others might have wondered about juvenile granulosa cell tumor. She was a somewhat younger female. On to the last and <clears throat> perhaps arguably my favorite uh, ovarian tumor group overall, the Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. We're going to run a little bit beyond the hour for my presentation. Some of you may have to leave and get to the real work of life, which is understandable, but some of you may be able to 
uh, stay for a bit longer, so I'll just continue talking here and show all the slides I have, or most of them. Sertoli lighting cell tumors, that term, of course, was introduced by Dr. Skelly in his 1958 work with Dr. Norris that I've referred to prior to that time. These tumors were referred to as a renoblastoma because of their frequent masculinization. But of course, about 50% of the tumors are not associated with masculinization, which is why Dr. Scully preferred the more descriptive Sertoli Leidig cell tumor uh, designation. They are classified largely according to their degree of differentiation. A breakdown first introduced by the great German pathologist, Dr. Robert Meyer, who with Dr. Scully is one of the two great giants of gynecologic pathology, as you may know. Or if you don't know, you now know, because take it from me, they are the two who stand above all others in the field of gynecologic pathology. And anyway, uh, Dr. Meyer described heterologous elements in these tumors and his various writings on them. Dr. Scully was the one who popularized the so-called Reediform pattern with which we will end the presentation. The great majority of these tumors are actually in the intermediate category and you see the frequency is the, the left column, FREs for frequency, age, and AND is short for androgenic. And the points about this really are that there's a slightly lesser frequency of androgenic manifestations for the tumors with a heterologous and reediform component. And the reediform tumors additionally occur in a somewhat younger age group. So just be aware of the slightly lesser androgenic manifestations and the particular youth of the patient with the reediform tumors. These tumors may be associated with the Dicer-1 syndrome. Uh, Dr. Schultz, Dr. Kristen Schultz is a gynecologic oncologist who works in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, and she's written some nice papers on this. I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to further get into this, but you see in the middle of the line here the various other tumors. Uh, pulmonary blastoma, cystic nephromas, and embryonal rhabdomyosarcomas that may occur in association with the Sertoli lighting cell tumor in these dice or one associated cases. Actually, in my original series of cases of Sertoli lighting, which Dr. Scully published back in 1984, I think one or two of the patients had embryonal rhabdo, but this, of course, was before the, this dice or one syndrome uh, was apparent uh, to us all. So you may want to read about that, but certainly be aware of some of the interesting clinical associations that one may occasionally see. These tumors are often yellow and lobulated. They may look a bit like the granulosa cell tumor family from time to time. You can't make the distinction from the gross, but this gross is somewhat more typical of Sertoli Leidig than it is a granulosa cell tumor. I did show you a yellow solid granulosa. I don't think it was quite as lobulated as this particular tumor. Well differentiated Sertoli Leidig speaks for itself well-differentiated tubules, many lytic cells in the inter intervening stroma. Sometimes the tubules can look a little bit endometrioid-like, so <laughs> the problem here is the endometrioid carcinoma can have tubules that look a bit sertoliform. Sometimes the sertoliform tubules of, an, of a sertoli lytic can look a little bit endometrioid-like. It doesn't show well from this picture, but it's actually these abundant lytic cells in the stroma here, but of course we've already mentioned you can see lutein cells in an endometrioid carcinoma. This is an area obviously where inhibin could help you if you had any issues. The intermediate tumors, let's go through these very quickly, not belabor them because of the time constraints we all have. Lobulation is very characteristic of tumors of intermediate differentiation. In the lobules you get various admixture of darkly blue Sertoli cells, cells and eosinophilic lydic cells. Poorly differentiated tumors may have very uh, limited evidence of Sertoliform differentiation. Much of the tumor may look like a bad sarcoma, once in a while even just a bad carcinoma. But in a young patient in particular, take lots of sections because you might be able to end up placing the tumor in the poorly differentiated Sertoli lydic category. Here's a nice example of the mucinous heterologous elements. If you have a mucinous cystic tumor and you see a bright yellow nodule somewhere between the, the cyst of the tumor, you think po possibly of a Sertoli Leidig cell tumor with mucinous heterologous elements. And here you see obvious mucinous epithelium with delicate cords of Sertoli Leidig cell tumor between the mucinous glands. And here's an example of what I just short, short mentioned to you. It's an old file picture, it's a bit out of focus, but it still serves a purpose. Much of this tumor is a mucinous cystic tumor, but towards the top and down the kind of right-hand side, one sees yellow tissue 
which was the more classic Sertoli Leidig of that particular tumor. Here is a list of some of the things in the differential diagnosis of this particular uh, neoplasm. I keep that for a checklist. We don't have time to go through them all. But one particular tumor to mention, I think, is the Krukenberg tumor, because that's an issue where you can make a very embarrassing misdiagnosis if you confuse a Krukenberg tumor and a Sertoli Leidig cell tumor, because you're talking about a good prognosis tumor most of the time versus a tumor, of course, which is going to be associated with the death of the patient. Uh, very soon, most of the time. Patients are often young. Each tumor may be androgenic. Remember, the Krukenberg tumor is one of the, is probably the metastatic tumor to the ovary axis, most often associated with androgenic manifestations. They're often both soft. They may have a pseudolobular pattern, microscopic examination. Well, that's typical of Sertoli Leidig and certainly seen in some Krukenberg tumors. They may have a tubular pattern. The Sertoli Leidig may have signet ring cells and the mucinous heterologous elements. And both, of course, may have lutein or Leidig cells that may be indistinguishable from each other if you don't happen to find crystals of Renke in the Leidig cells. This is a Krukenberg tumor. You may vaguely get a sense of some signet ring cells, but in low par, quick uh, frozen section or even permanent evaluation, Anyone might think of Sertoli Leidig cell tumor because of the lobulated growth you see here. So obviously you have to go on high power, as you well know. With regard to tubules, this is a uh, sentimental area for me because it takes me back to when I was a lot younger, back in 1981. And some of you listening to this, maybe were not born in 1981. Anyway, Dr. Bion, who is a visitor from Spain, with Dr. Arsenault, who's practiced in Montreal for many years, Dr. Pratt, who I mentioned earlier, the great Spanish pathologist, uh, worked up with Dr. Scully and myself. Some Krukenberg tumors that Dr. Scully had been sent, there were actually 13 at that time, I believe, if my memory again is okay, which had been sent to him with the diagnosis of Sertoli Leidig cell tumor because they had a tubular pattern, but they weren't, they weren't Sertoli Leidig cell tumors. They were Krukenberg tumors that had tubules. Of course, they were often bilateral, they had signet ring cells, not within the heterologous element of a Sertoli Leidig. There are different reasons why they, of course, were Krukenberg tumors, not uh, Sertoli Leidig cell tumors. For example, here are the tubules with, with signet ring cells. You don't see tubules, you don't see signet ring cells in the tubules of Sertoli tubules. Here they are in higher power. Here is a Sertoli Leidig cell tumor actually with another feature. We're moving on now from the tubular Krukenberg, which I just gave you a few quick comments on. Uh, pregnancy can induce funny changes in ovarian tumors of many different types we don't have time to get into today. But one of them is that if a patient has a sex cord stromal tumor and is removed when she's pregnant, there's often a lot of edema. And this is actually a Sertoli Leidig cell tumor you're looking at, even though none of us could make that diagnosis on this slide. This loose feathery edema imparts a slight resemblance to the reticular pattern of yolk sac tumor. Other areas, of course, were diagnostic as Sertoli Leidig cell tumor. This was a paper some years ago myself, Dr. Gatewood Dudley, a gynecologic oncologist from Atlanta, and Dr. Scully and I published in Gynecologic Oncology on various changes in sex cord stromal tumors in pregnant patients. I think in the interest of time, we'll go through that. This is, of course, a great triad of papers that Dr. Scully, or entities that Dr. Scully popularized in the family of ovarian tumors in young people. And we will conclude now, of course, with one of these, the middle one here, the so-called Rediform Sertoli Leidig cell tumor, because it was a pattern of Sertoli Leidig cell neoplasia, which was not popularized until he and I wrote up 25 cases in 1983 in this particular paper, which came about because I would observe, and going through his cases of Sertoli Leidig cell tumors that were sent in to him, questioning was this a serous borderline tumor, was this a serous carcinoma, et cetera, et cetera. And Dr. Scully, in his uh, understated manner, would often say he was a very uh, gentle, kind man. He would be pleasant to people when they made their wrong diagnosis. And he would say something like, well, you were quite, quite appropriate to consider a serous neoplasm, Dr. X. But that would be a little bit unusual in a 15-year-old girl. This is actually an unusual pattern of Sertoli Leidig cell tumor that I refer to as Rediform because the papillae and slit-like tubules of the neoplasm recapitulate, of course, what one sees in a normal Read testis and ovary, and then he would say the same thing in another case, another case. 
And anyway, to cut a long story short, I said, gee, Dr. Skelly, it doesn't seem too many people know about this except you. Why didn't we write them up? And he said, well, if you want to, go ahead. And I did, and it's my favorite of all papers. So there you are. Uh, it can be a remarkable uh, case because grossly there are two features that can be very, very distinctive. Polypoid grape-like vesicles, as you see on the left, and then a soft, spongy appearance, as you see on the right. I encourage you, if you see ovarian tumor from young people under 15 or up to 15 years of age with either of these gross appearances, please be thinking of really form sort totally lady cell tumor and did you might even make the diagnosis on the gross and if you're correct your colleagues are going to think you're wonderful at least wonderful until you make the next mistake in your career and the microscopic correlate of the polypoid vesicles i've just shown you are seen here but then you see at the bottom right the formations that sometimes make people think of serous which we'll get to in a minute the soft spongy gross appearance is uh, accounted for microscopically, of course, by a lot of edema, as you can see here. And this is why people who are not familiar with this entity might think these are serous tumors, quite forgiv forgivable. I think you would all agree looking at that like that or looking at that. And in conclusion, I will just say that sampling, 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 sampling is the mantra of the good surgical pathologist. And of course, other areas will show typical Sertoli lytic cell tumor. So I, for I forgot I had this slide in. The papillarity of these tumors is sometimes characterized by prominent stromal hyalinization. Remember, in an older woman, papillae are typically hyalinized most often than the papillae of clear cell carcinoma. In a younger female, the papillae of this tumor may be hyalinized. Another fundamental bedrock of ovarian tumor pathology evaluation is, of course, the age of the patient. This tumor was sent to Dr. Skelly with the diagnosis of malignant mixed mesodermal tumor. She was a 12-year-old girl, highly unlikely to have a triple MT carcinosarcoma. It looked like a carcinosarcoma, but it wasn't a carcinosarcoma of the endometrioidasmullarian family of tumors because, of course, there are typical retiformed tubules with papillae here, and this is just a cellular mesenchyme you can see in any moderate to high-grade Sertoli lytic cell tumor. And I mentioned earlier, sampling, sampling, sampling. Here at the right and at the left, we see retiformed tubules linked up by typical columns of sex cord-like Sertoli cells. And actually, in the retiformed Sertoli lytic cell tumor, you often get particularly long, elongated uh, formations, rather thicker, longer ribbons than you see in the non really form Sertoli lytic cell tumors, which can actually be a subtle clue to the diagnosis uh, once in a while. So I will conclude at that juncture, at this uh, point, that is my last slide, except for, if, I guess, for this slide, uh, resorting back to one of these courses I have in the future. Maybe one or two of you will be tempted by the fact that I'm giving seven talks at this course. I think that's too many because I'll end up a little bit tired, but I'll, I'll get through them all, I think. I don't believe I'm talking on sex cord stromal tumors and their mimics, but rather diverse other areas in gynecologic pathology, along with Dr. Wenig, the very eminent, well-known head and neck expert now at Moffat in Tampa, Florida. My colleague, Dr. Vikram Despandi, whom if you haven't heard, you will enjoy hearing, as also my fellow colleague from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Elizabeth Morgan, an outstanding hematopathologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Dr. Dora Lam Himlin, an outstanding younger uh, member of the team who practices gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal pathology and is one of the GI experts at the Mayo Clinic, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. So I thank you all for your attention. I don't know if we have time for any questions. Dr. Madrigal, I'll be happy to answer any. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Young, for that excellent presentation on sex stromal tumors and for sharing so many beautiful gross images and photomicrographs with us. I'll tell you that the PathCast community is truly appreciative of your time, and I just want to briefly mention that you know, you've, your session has already reached several hundred pathologists from around the globe, and I'll just name a few countries. Uh, that's Algeria, Colombia, Denmark, Egypt, Mexico, Pakistan, Tanzania, and Vietnam. And again, that's wow. just to name a few. 
So That's again, well, well, hello to everyone who's still listening. I don't think those people are going to travel over to Arizona. <laughs> uh, maybe someday. <laughs> or maybe someday I'll travel there. Who knows? There well, I do have a, a couple of questions if you have time. Uh, sure. One question is from a uh, viewer on YouTube, and he asks, how often do you define an adult granulosa cell tumor with the FOXL2 mutation? Oh, I very rarely, to be candid with you, have cause to uh, investigate the mutation. It can actually be misleading. There was a recent case. I mentioned a fibromatous granulosa cell tumor I saw just yesterday. That had been done in that case and was misleading, I think, because they did the stain <laughs> on a slide that was just stromal. So, you know, you've got to be very careful on what, which block you utilize for any of these preparations. Right. And I'll be candid with you. I think if your knowledge base of the spectrum of morphology of granulosa cell tumors is sound enough, and of course, I've been forced to see hundreds and hundreds of cases. So I'm not saying you shouldn't use it, because, you know, obviously it, it's, it can be helpful. But uh, you've got to be careful that you use it in the right block. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, uh, there's one more question I have here, and it's from one of our Facebook users. And the question is, in regards to age, how watertight would you say the difference is between an adult and juvenile form of granulosa cell tumor? Well, I mean, nothing in life or a few things in life are watertight, maybe apart from squamous differentiation, not being present as x stromal tumors. But in the adult versus juvenile, well, you've got to make the diagnosis on the microscopic findings, of course, but it just is the case that none of you, very few of you are ever going to see a classic juvenile granulosa cell tumor of someone of 60. Now, it's not impossible, but it's just highly, highly unlikely you're going to see it. It's a little bit more likely that you might see an adult granulosa cell tumor in someone who is a juvenile. So, you know, in young girls, 10, 11, 12, 15, et cetera, you might see an adult granulosa cell tumor. So you just have to make it based on the microscopy. That's why all these findings, age, history, sampling, et cetera, et cetera, all crucial. But at the end of the day, you know, it's what, what the tumor tells you it is by microscopic examination that ultimately is going to be the one that uh, dominates your diagnostic decision making. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you again, Dr. Young. And I, I, just before we go, I just want to quickly mention to the viewers that obviously cannot see where we're sitting, uh, that we're surrounded by hundreds of these tray drawer cabinets. And I was wondering if you would mind sharing, uh, you know, what our viewers cannot see, you know, where we're well, sitting. Well, uh, yes, no, I'm sitting in uh, my office at the Massachusetts General Hospital, the Warren Building of the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Warren is the famous surgeon who was the first person to do what they, to demonstrate the use of ether uh, publicly. There's a little dispute, as you may know, Dr. Crawford Long is considered the first person to actually use ether to anesthetize a patient, but Dr. Warren was the first to do it in a public forum in 1846 at this hospital. So this hospital is named after Dr. Warren and other members of the very famous family of physicians, surgeons in Massachusetts. So we're on the second floor of the Warren Building overlooking the Charles River, which one can see because it's winter time here and the trees are rather bare with no leaves. It's a nice clear blue sky day, but if you go outside you better wear a very heavy coat because it's very cold. Uh, I'm in the office that Dr. Scully occupied for uh, many, many years. I'm looking at a photograph of Dr. Scully here on my wall, autographed to me by him. And above that is a picture of Dr. Scully with Dr. Fred Stewart, the great pathologist from Memorial Hospital when Dr. Scully got the Fred Stewart Award of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, I think back in 1983. Or there are boys, and as Dr. Madrigal said, this is a large office, or he implied it's a large office. It better be a large office because I have a very large collection of books which I like to collect on pathology. And then a lot of the space is taken up by all Dr. Scully's consultation cases. By the time he retired, he had seen over 27,000 cases in referral. They were all kept separate from the main hospital material which is good for their remaining intact under my uh, supervision. And uh, they are available for people, current fellows, trainees, visitors to review. And as Dr. Madrigal said, they're just literally housed in the familiar trays that we keep slides in. Uh, most of them are still, obviously there's been some attrition over the years. A few of the older cases are lost, et cetera, et cetera. But we still have an amazing uh, collection
uh, of cases uh, for study. And of course, as accounted for many of the papers I referred to as I was going along uh, during the uh, lecture here. The younger people could do a lot worse than just kind of become familiar with Dr. Scully's papers in ovarian tumor pathology in particular, because I know many, Dr. Jason Norris that I mentioned, and many, many others have written excellent papers in ovarian tumor pathology, but you should certainly know all Dr. Scully's classic papers uh, in ovarian tumors if you're really going to set yourself up as an expert on the topic in your own department, and many of them are well worth a read, even though, of course, further papers and individual topics have come along uh, over the subsequent years. So, again, I'd just like to repeat my thanks to you all for taking the time to listen uh, to this presentation, and I hope it's been enjoyable, and I thank Dr. Madrigal, who's a wonderful young pathologist himself and very expert in all sorts of modern things, which I am not expert on, and without him, this session would not have taken place because he organized so beautifully all the technical aspects. And maybe, uh, maybe sometime we'll do another one. So thank you all very much. Thank you again, Dr. Young, and for sharing this, uh, your commitment to education and for all the wonderful historical pers perspectives. And thank you to our viewers. Take care.